right, folks. Just before the coffee, Dave had mentioned GDPR is one of the uh, significant issues for a lot of organizations. It's going to be very difficult to think of companies who won't in some way be impacted in about 14 months from now when uh, GDPR finally kicks in. We're going to kick off with a discussion of those implications and a bit of an analysis of those implications from one of the country's leading uh, data protection legal experts. Will you please welcome from Ronan Daily German, Brian McCarthy. Thanks very much, Anton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to speak with you today on data protection and the law. Though it's slightly unnerving when you get up onto the stage and Jason Burns is going, listen, good luck with that. And he starts unfurling the iPod earphones and I'm convinced he's going to put them in. But um, something very big is happening next year. Um, and after, uh, after much deliberation and discussion and cross-border diplomacy, Ireland is going to experience something next year that it hasn't experienced in quite a number of years. It's a, I suppose it's a testament to where Ireland ranks in this context that um, in 2018, Pope Francis is coming to Ireland. And whilst a lot of you might be feeling in need of some divine inspiration to get your arms and indeed your head around GDPR, my, my task today is in very simple terms to, to share some of the experiences and dealings that I've had with my clients. So clients that span a range of industries from very early stage tech startups on the one hand to household recognized brand names on the other. Because at the end of the day, every company deals with personal data, whether it is customer data, employees, service providers. And the aim for me today is to, in very simple terms, give you the main highlights of GDPR for you to take away, consider, and implement as necessary. So GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, general in name and general in nature. And it increases the number of individuals that have rights, and it also, from our collective perspective, it also significantly increases the number of obligations that are on companies as well. And it's going to be a challenge. And one of the, um, one of the key things that I'm telling my, um, my, my clients when they're asking me, well, look, what is the, uh, you know, what's the big stick here? What do I really need to, to be aware of? And that is, is very simple, that the chatter in the corridor is very much around fines, the administrative fines. Um, under GDPR, breach of the higher tier provision can result in a fine of up to 4% of the preceding financial year's global worldwide turnover, or 20 million euro, whichever is greater. So, by way of example, in 2013, Yahoo was hacked, and this wasn't disclosed until the end of 2016. Now, had GDPR applied to Yahoo, these are the sorts of figures that you'd be looking at. In 2016, Yahoo's global annual revenue was just north of $5.1 billion, not a small amount. If the higher tier provisions were to have applied to Yahoo, it would have been in line for an eye-wateringly high fine of $240 million. Now, when you compare that against the maximum fine applicable to most companies under the existing Data Protection Acts of 100,000 euro, then you start seeing the numbers taking effect. Now, we all know that there's only one Yahoo, but there are very many of you. And the key question then is, is GDPR applicable to your organization? So, applicability in, in, in very simple terms, under the existing regime, um, there are, there is no distinguishing between EU established businesses and non-EU established businesses. And under GDPR, it sets out in fairly clear detail that in fact, regardless effectively of where the processing takes place, you're on the hook if you as a company sell goods and services within the EU or alternatively if you monitor data subjects within the EU. So for example, 
If an Australian company has offices and staff in Sydney and it undertakes a targeted marketing campaign aimed at data subjects or individuals in Ireland, it's on the hook because it's supplying goods and services within the EU. If there's a mobile phone manufacturing company in Shenzhen and it produces mobile phone covers and it decides, oh, you know what, we're gonna flag a whole pile of these online to our customers in Ireland, it's on the hook as well. It's selling goods within the EU. If there's a data analytics company over in San Francisco and it's been engaged by uh, the, the, say the senior management of, a, of an Irish company to undergo a, a continuous behavior assessment for, for progression and promotion purposes, it's on the hook as well because it's monitoring individuals within the EU. So as you can see, GDP core casts a very wide net indeed when it comes to its applicability. And in simple terms, applicability means that does the GDPR apply to you? And if GDPR is like a fishing rod, applicability is the hook, and then accountability is what reels you in. And Dave and Rick earlier on were talking a little bit towards accountability, and, and crucially under GDPR, not only are companies responsible for compliance with GDPR, but they now actually have to demonstrate it as well. And when I'm advising clients on this and what they likely can expect, some of the, the key uh, tips and guidance that I give them are actually those which the GDPR sets out rather helpfully for, for once. Um, the main one is to, to follow the guidance of the Office of Data Protection Commissioner and in time the European Data Protection Board as well. And recently her office uh, issued a, a number of pieces of guidance. Two in particular, one, the right on data portability, and two is in relation to data protection officers and, and a little bit more about those in due course. Listening to your DPO, so a data protection officer, if you're required to have one under GDPR or if you voluntarily sign up to, to, to have one as well. Um, codes, certificate, codes of conduct, certifications, marks and seal, these are all new concepts under GDPR. Um, I'll deal a little bit about those also. But essentially, if you're able to, to demonstrate that you have the certain requirements satisfied under GDPR, and there's an accredited body that gives you the seal of approval, you're able to demonstrate that you're GDPR compliant in that particular space. And, and lastly, one which some people are slightly confused about is this new concept of privacy by design. So to give you a, a practical example of it, Typically, I mean, you know how it works. An organization that decides that it's going to, to undergo a change in the business, whether it's an operational change or some other change, um, it may need to, to consult some of the key stakeholders. So it, there may be HR, legal, finance, who's footing the bill, IT. And those stakeholders will be involved at the beginning of the, the, the change and through its implementation right up to execution. And it's only at the execution stage that I, that I find with my clients that people go, oh, actually, hang on a second, this probably has a bit of an impact on individuals, on privacy rights. And what privacy by design is intended to do is to take that light bulb moment and take it from the end of the process and bring it right back to the beginning. So it, like the others, is a key stakeholder. And that it's privacy by design not by default. Privacy is ingrained in the DNA of the project and it's not dealt with by way of an afterthought. So this point about demonstrating compliance is really, really crucial to the, the principles of, of GDPR and it's something that I urge you all to move forward and up or up the list of your, of your things to do. So, having looked at some of the, the higher level points, let's delve a little deeper into, into some of the specifics. Without a doubt, the single biggest concern that, that uh, or one of them at least, that my clients have when they, when they talk to me is around the area of consents. 
So this is consent in very simple terms to the processing of, of personal data. And you remember, it's the little box you tick right at the beginning of engagement with a service provider by and large. And service providers are worried because their consents could be out of date. They may have envisaged a type of processing day one, which actually bears no resemblance to how the data is being processed today. Um, they may be uh, dealing with a different data controller the process may have changed, the, the business may have been hived off, um, and in particular, following a surge in, in cloud-based computing, and we've certainly heard a lot of that this morning, um, consents which don't anticipate at all the, in, the transfer of data on an international basis to some of these cloud-based um, storage providers. And it's crucial to note that the conditions under GDPR for a valid consent to be given are now much, much tighter and they're, they're much stricter. So for a valid consent to be given, uh, for a consent to be valid, it must be freely given, it must be specific, it must be informed, and it must be unambiguous. That is given in a clear or by way of a clear affirmative action. So gone are the days then of inaction, of pre-ticked boxes, of, um, of silence constituting a valid consent. And in practical terms then, this means that companies will really need to run the rule over their consents. And how I describe it is it's like the old Ron C. lad. Consent and processing, it needs to do exactly what it says on the tin. It's also important to, to note at this stage that data subjects now have a right to withdraw consent. And in fact, although they have that right to withdraw it at any stage, in fact, for the consent to be valid in the first place, data subjects, individuals must be given, the, it must be told that they have the right to withdraw the consent at any time. And I can't put it any clearer than GDPR itself when it says it must be as easy to provide the consent in the first place as to withdraw it. So, so one area that I'd like to touch on in a little bit of detail because GDPR places a particular focus on it is the whole area of, of children's data, children's rights, children's consent. And, and the main reason there is because I think it's appreciated by everybody that children don't appreciate some or all of the risks in the same way that, that an adult would. Um, and we, we've seen it all ourselves. You know, little kids pressing the button at the bottom of the iPad, or you know, they're, they're running their finger across anything that looks like a screen at all. Um, and we've seen a huge surge in the level of electronic information that's being transferred between companies and individuals. And I'm particularly uh, interested in how it impacts on my clients in the healthcare and the education industries. I mean, my own kids now, there's, a, there's an app where you find out exactly what they're doing uh, of a given day, what books they need to do, where they're going to be going on their school trips, etc. Under GDPR, a child must be 16 years of age to give a valid consent. Children under 16, the consent must be given by a parent or by those with res parental responsibility. Now, GDPR does allow member states to, to drop that age below 16, provided that it doesn't go below 13. And interestingly, the first state consultation on GDPR was in relation to the children's digital age of consent. And that closed last December, 3rd of December. And it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out in the upcoming data protection bill. So a question that, that clients regularly ask me then is, well, I'm not sure about the consent. I don't think it's valid. Uh, I think it's out of date, uh, mislaid it, or in fact, I can tell you, Brian, I actually, we don't have a consent at all. Um, are, we, are we snookered? Well, not quite. So for a, a, a controller to process the personal data of an individual, they must be sure that they have a legal basis to process. 
but you don't actually need consent in all circumstances. And helpfully, GDPR sets out a number of areas whereby companies, businesses who don't have valid consent can use one of a number of criteria for the processing to be lawful. And the one most regularly used in practice is that of legitimate interest. So um, in, in simple terms, legitimate interest is, you know, the legitimate interest of the controller on the one hand in terms of delivering their product or in terms of operating their business. And then on the other hand, you've got the fundamental rights uh, and freedoms of the data subject. And provided that the legitimate interests of the business don't override the fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, then you're in business. Well, what does that mean? So, I suppose, it, it, by way of example, if you have a, a company that's subject of a sale and the, the company itself has a very large customer database full of very sensitive personal pieces of, of, uh, of information, it may be that day one, that when consent of those individuals was being obtained, that nobody anticipated the company would be sold on. So the question then is, well, it's clearly in the legitimate interests of, the, of the, the shareholders to sell on the company. Does that override the fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject? I'd suggest it probably doesn't. So there is an example of legitimate interest. There are other legitimate interest examples under GDPR when you are combating a fraud where there are intra-group transfers of personal data. So say one company is moving its client data over to another company or there's employee data being moved across. That's an example of legitimate interest and probably very relevant in, in today's context um, where there is a, it's necessary or proportionate for the protection of network or information security. That's another example of, of legitimate interest as well. So one of the, the big talking points for, for under GDPR is the, the newly created role of data protection officer. And this is required in, in three instances. One, if you're a public authority. Two, if you undertake uh, regular and systematic monitoring of individuals on a large scale. And three, if you are processing sensitive personal data on a large scale as well. And data protection officers, and I, and I know certainly having, having spoken to some of the other panel members, there's going to be a, hopefully a fairly lively discussion this afternoon on just well, how do you actually fill the role. What GDPR says is that the person must have professional qualifications. They must have data protection expertise. They must report into the highest level of management. So you need that senior management buy-in. They also need to be listened to as well. Um, and that's sort of where things start getting slightly murky because people think, well, who's the best person for this? Well, you know, we take Dave from IT and you know, we send him on a data protection course. And sure, hey presto. Yeah, well, getting somebody internally probably doesn't satisfy your independence requirement because when a data protection officer is appointed, not only does the data controller need to make sure that their details are published and they're there for, for the world to see, but they also actually have to follow the guidance of the DPO. They have to involve the DPO in all matters data protection. Probably comes as no surprise. They can't be hidden away in the corner. But they, they need to be independent. They can't be directed to do anything. And that's where the tension begins to, uh, to arise. I mean, who's the paymaster here? How does that work? They also, interestingly, can't be fired, excuse me, for performing their tasks. So data subject rights, this is, I see, a really, really hot area for, for all businesses. Um, the GDPR enshrines a lot of the existing rights, existing, already existing under the, the Irish Data Protection Acts. Um, but it also creates some new rights as well. Um, and 
it's, 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 what's interesting is I know that consumer groups have been tracking with interest the development of these, not only the existing rights, because there are a few new bells and whistles to some of them, but also some of the new rights as well. And, and two really spring to mind. One is the, uh, the right to, um, to, to have your data erased. And it's akin to the, to the right to be forgotten that some of you may have heard um, from, the, from the Google Spain case. The second, uh, which, is, which is quite interesting, is the right, it's a new right, it's the right to data portability. And what that right is, is if I'm an individual, I'm a data subject, and I give a whole pile of my personal data to service provider A, I can then ring them up one day and I say, do you know what, I want you to transfer all of the data that I've given you across to uh, service provider B. So in a practical sense, uh, you know, who are these people likely to be? Well, we, we heard Martin er, earlier on saying all those who have a Sky account sit down. Well, if all those people with their Sky accounts wanted to move across to Virgin, all they need to do is ring up and say, just shovel everything across, thanks very much. Now, it just so happens that a lot of those uh, service providers have switcher teams in place. It's the same with the utilities as well, whether you're going from Borgosh to SSE or to Energia or whatever it is. But for... Entities that aren't used to that, are you all ready to deal with a request to port data across to another service provider? The age-old data subject access request is also worth mentioning as well. And you know the drill here. You've got 40 days once you get the, the, uh, the letter in. And in fact, it doesn't need to be a letter at all. It can be an email. Um, it lands on your desk you realize that actually it's been sitting on somebody else's desk for the last two weeks, so you're already down about a third of your time. There's a mad scramble to call up all of the files. You get your electronic records. You take the top off the big black marker. You start redacting. You put everything into an envelope. You shovel it all out the door, and you cross your fingers that you don't hear from the, uh, from the data subject again. Well, that world is about to change, and not for the better. Not only do is your 40 days now 30 days, but that big juicy check that you used to get for the six euro 35, you know the one that was to cover all of the cost of this? Well, that's now gone, so you're doing it for free. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. If, you, if people want additional copies, you can, you can charge a reasonable fee for it, and indeed, um, the 30 days, that can be extended by two further one-month periods as well but I kind of get the feeling that the noose is tightening a little bit on that one, I have to say. So security obligations. So here's my scary slide. It's not really that scary, but um, we're hearing an awful lot today about security obligations under GDPR, and we plan to thrash it out a good bit more in this afternoon's panel discussion as well. But from a legal perspective, there are a couple of important points to note. First of all, when approaching, well, what do I do? Well, you can have regard to three things. You can have regard to state of the art, or as I describe it, the state of technological development. You can have regard to the cost of the security measures. You can also have regard to the type of personal data that you're processing. And once you've had regard to those three things, then you need to be able to put in place appropriate technical and security measures to deal appropriately with a risk of a data breach to that particular um, personal data. It's, a, it's, it, it's, it's quite nebulous, um, but one thing that I, that I would like to say is that um, in practical terms, that means that if you are an early stage business, you don't have a lot of money, or maybe you are dealing in personal data that really isn't that high risk in the, in the hierarchy of things, well, then you don't need the Rolls Royce of technological measures to be implemented. You may want to because of your brand or your, your, your reputation or some other stakeholder, but not strictly required under GDPR. But what happens when there is 
a data breach, there is a notification. Well, you've got 72 hours to inform the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, or which will be the, the National Supervisory Authority, and if it's high risk, you need to contact the data subject without delay. I have three seconds, two seconds, one second, there we go. Right, a quick note on codes of conduct certifications, marks and seals. I think this is a really, really welcome development because up until now, certainly under the Irish data protection law, it was all principle-based. You had your eight core principles. Uh, I think, well, that's great, but how do I apply it to my day-to-day -day operations? Well, under GDPR, Member states and supervisory authorities, they're encouraged to put into place accredited bodies that will be able to test and mark companies in a particular area and give them a certification, a mark or a seal. And this is a voluntary measure and the seals and marks and certifications can last up to, to three years on, uh, for, um, until renewal. And I think this is very welcome in order to be able to demonstrate compliance um, by way of a reliable and auditable, fr auditable framework. International data transfers, again, we're going to cover this later on, having spoken with the others, but it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, actually, to keep an eye on how Facebook and Schrems is playing out. I mean, at the end of the day, we're just we're the tiny dot on the edge of Europe, which itself is only a small sub subset of the, the broader global sphere, and yet it's all happening in our backyard. I mean, what happens as part of this? We've already seen the impact that it's had on Safe Harbor. We've seen the impact that it's having on Privacy Shield. So standard contractual clauses, the EU model clause, are sure everybody's been using them for years and all of a sudden they're under threat as well. So in conclusion, companies have 14 months to get their house in order before kickoff. And what I've prepared for you today are my, my cyber essentials for secure IT and there's a copy of those in each of your registration packs. But the, the simplest piece of advice that I can give you today is whether you've learned of GDPR for the first time recently or you've had your head in the sand is, although Better Call Brian hasn't got the same ring as Better Call Saul, you know, call me or call your legal advisor because we're, we're here to help. So May 2018 and Pope Francis are fast approaching. Are you ready? Thank you.